It's the Kyle Hyman Show on Redeemer Radio. This is Kyle Hyman, and join us to talk about the Bible and some biblical surprises and what Catholics really need to know about Scripture study is Father Bill Burton. Thank you for being here, Father Bill. Thank you for having me, Kyle. Do you have a favorite book of the Bible or a favorite story? Oh, certainly favorite book would be uh, Luke Acts, the Gospel of Luke and Acts of the Apostles. Hmm. Why is that? Because... First, I think Luke gives us an insight into the stresses and strains within the early Christian community between Gentiles and Jewish Christians, and he is himself a Gentile, kind of struggling against what was then a kind of Jewish-Christian majority in the early church, and he really pushed for Paul's openness to the Gentiles. So his memories of, of stories and parables of Jesus clearly are addressing that issue. And I, I just like the fact that it parts the curtains to show us some of the stresses and strains of the early history that the other Gospels don't. Yeah. And, and, and it was what I studied mostly. <laughs> How did you get into studying Scripture in the first place? <laughs> uh, my boss told me to. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was weird. I was actually going in a completely other direction my last couple of years uh, doing my master's. Uh, I was headed for uh, more pragmatic kind of clinical work with alcoholics and drug addict studies for my certification. And one day my provincial came in and said, uh, we think you ought to go get a doctorate in scripture. <laughs> <laughs> it was a little crazy. I thought maybe he should have been one of my clients for alcoholism and drug addiction. I said, Are you crazy? <laughs> because that wasn't something that you were excited about or interested in? Well, I was very, and in fact, on my own, because of my own interest, I had done Greek and Hebrew, which was not required when I was in the seminary. So he looked at my transcript and he said, but, well, why did you do Greek and Hebrew? I said, well, because I was kind of tired of people telling me what the text meant and the discussions about interpretations and stuff. And I thought, well, I've got some extra time. So I did, you know, the extra language work. And he said, well, you've already got part of the battle done. So, <laughs> well, it was clear, it was clear there was no discussion to be had. And it kind of dawned on me in the middle of our back and forth. I, I said, oh, oh, this is the obedience part, isn't it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> so what do you think keeps people from studying scripture? We know it's important. We know that we're, it's the Word of God. But why do we not put so much importance on it, and why do we not dig into it? Kyle, I, I think Catholics and the, the terrible low literacy, biblical literacy rate amongst Catholics is just a, a historical inheritance. We had you know, so many centuries of fighting with the Reformers and the Protestant traditions who were emphasizing it, I think we got swept up for a very long time in our attempts to swing the pendulum in the other direction. I mean, we all heard horrible stories about our parents and grandparents being told that, you know, Catholics don't study the Bible. And I think that's the biggest block is this historical legacy we have, which has been over since the 1940s at least, if not earlier. And yet, Catholics still have this reticence and fear. You know, that's one thing. The other thing, Kyle, I, I used to do a lot of traveling around parishes doing Bible study programs, and so often the pastor or the assistant pastor at the parish would tell me, God, I hated my scripture courses in, in the seminary. So I, I think there's a huh. reticence even on the part of, of the priests, the pastors and, and assistant you know, associates, because of their experience or their own reticence, or they just they feel like they're not competent in this area to, to stir up an interest at their parish level, you know? So when we're talking about studying Scripture, how would you differentiate between studying Scripture and merely reading Scripture? Well, of course, I'm biased because I'm a, a professor myself, but I, I think in order to deepen your understanding of what you're reading, the contextual background, the historical, cultural stuff, mm -hmm. Uh, would help open up the text that you're looking at. I mean, many of us, we open up the page and you're not quite sure, what does Paul mean by this? You know, or you hear it in church at the readings. Well, some study would really open up the text a lot. And I think you'd find it less intimidating. One would find it less intimidating. And, 
and I think really quite enjoyable and spiritually fulfilling, but it's a hard sell. <laughs> So the first part of your book goes through some of the basics of scripture. Can you talk about some of the first steps that people should take when engaging with scripture and trying to get more out of it? Well, I think the first step really would be to do some reading outside of scripture first. So look, get a, a an easy a textbook type. A, a textbook sounds intimidating too, I guess, but... <laughs> I hate to say it, but Kyle, but be like the Bible for Dummies book, mm-hmm. and, and there are a lot of good Catholic introduction to Scripture. That would be a big help. The Catholic uh, study Bible that has good introductions to the different sections and books of the Bible is a big help. It's kind of a, we used to call it in Rome, a propedeutic, the, the stuff you do before you start studying to prepare yourself. I think the other thing is a one-volume commentary where you can you know, you run, you're reading through the Gospel of Matthew and you hit a confusing verse. Well, one volume commentary next to you, you can look up exactly that verse and see what the commentary has to say to explain the verse. It's kind of a toolkit, I think, that you should have at hand and prepare a little bit ahead of time. Yeah, how often do you think whenever we hit those stumbling blocks, do we either just not get that much out of it because we kind of uh, just push it to the side or maybe even get the wrong impression, the wrong interpretation, because we don't understand the proper context. Yeah, so I think you've hit on the reason that people kind of shut down when they hit challenges in the text, and that's where your own personal initiative in, in doing some preparation work. You know, there's a there's kind of a cycle I find in, in Roman Catholic lay people in, in the regular parish. They're a little intimidated. You start opening up some of the text and giving them some of the background. Oh, and then the, the, that, that little light over their head goes on, you know, the aha moment. Uh-huh. And, and the guy in the pew, the lady in the pew realizes, oh, that's fascinating. Gee, that's so interesting. Well, then they're self-propelling. You know, you don't have to tug them along anymore because their own interest and satisfaction with their opening, beginning study makes them feel good and excited and then they're propelling themselves on their own you know Hmm. one of the things i used to get from parishioners i do these four or five day long bible studies and i often would hear somebody would say father i've been a catholic all my life and i've never heard this how come i've never heard this and i always said well i got here as fast as i can (laughs) but the real but the real reason is for some reason we catholics kind of stopped at whatever the last catholic uh, school we went to Mm -hmm. we stop at that level and i said well you know your arithmetic skills improved and your your english and reading and writing skills improved but somehow we left the bible study thing on the shelf and wonder why i'm 40 years old and i'm still puzzled by scripture so well you know, we're literate. Go see if you can find a good Catholic resource. Like I say, a one-volume commentary or or Catholic introductions to the Bible. And, and you can kind of do a lot of this on your own. Father doesn't have to, you know, lead you by the nose. You can you can self-educate and, and stir up some of your own interest. I, you know, it's hard, that's a hard sell, too. I got, I'm always very careful not to put the blame on, on the people or put the blame only on, on uh, the pastors, mm-hmm. regardless of that, just start, just dip your toe in the water and, and your, your own interests will guide you and you'll come through the other side realizing, gee, I never knew it. I really liked the prophet Obadiah. I never knew it. I really liked the, you know, Acts of the Apostles or yeah. Revelation finally makes sense to me, that kind of thing. I, I would say it, it, two things. You know, the Bible text itself can be difficult, but also the church pronouncements can be difficult. You know, that's written in churchy language, and as wonderful as those documents are, you can't usually, at first glance, appreciate what, what you're being told in the text. So, yeah. it, it, like I say, it, it's a hard sell. Only in the beginning, though. I think once over that first hump, most people find it's very rewarding, and that propels them to dig deeper on their own. Sure. We're talking with Father Bill Burton. The book he wrote is called Abba Isn't Daddy and Other Biblical Surprises, What Catholics Really Need to Know About Scripture Study. And can you talk about some of those biblical surprises that you break down in the book? Well, the title itself is is from the the notion that the word Abba that we find in the Lord's Prayer Uh and in Paul's writings 
many of us have heard in sermons and stuff that that term is two things, that it's unique. No Jew before Jesus ever addressed God that way. And the second thing is that the word Abba is a very, very familiar and intimate term of endearment between a child and his father. Sure. But that's not true. And the man who kind of started this, a man, uh, a great, really a great scholar, a German Lutheran scholar named Joachim Jeremias, who was writing in the 50s, he's the one that first proposed this. And even he later in the 60s kind of retracted, stepped way back and said, oops, I made a mistake. But but that idea is so compelling. You know, it does sound very nice. It makes Jesus unique. We all like the notion of an intimate relationship with God the Father. So even on its own, the ball ball keeps rolling. It's like the mistake in the headline on Sunday is retracted on page four on Monday, but nobody reads the retraction. (laughs) Right. You know, it's that kind of a thing. And and we've all, many of us have, I was just talking to the pastor here, or I'm living at this parish, and he had said, oh, he'd heard that, you know, for years and years. But it's it's just not true. So that that to me was a big surprise that that in fact Jews have addressed God as Father almost from the beginning of Judaism, and that the word Abba is not a term of intimacy at all. In fact, it's rather a formal term. Even Paul, when he uses the word twice in his letters, he always translates that Aramaic word in parentheses after he says Abba. Then he says in Greek, oh, that is the Father. Hmm. Well, the Father is not a term of intimacy. And there were Greek words at the time of Paul for Papa and Daddy, very well-known words that Paul, who knew Greek extremely well, would have, could have used if he meant to translate the Aramaic word as Papa, and he never does. So that that's a surprise. Yeah. Can you I, give us a couple of the other surprises that are in the book? Well, I think the idea of of sitting at table, for example, there's a text where Jesus in this parable, for example, of Lazarus and the rich man, where knowing that the Hellenistic culture in which Jesus was raised, and certainly the first century lived in, they didn't sit at table, they reclined on couches. But our translations very often will take the Greek word, which clearly and unambiguously means to recline on a couch, translates it as sit because we, the target audience, sit at table to eat, Uh which is okay. There's a cultural difference there. But in the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, it makes a big difference because when Lazarus dies, Jesus tells us in the parable, where does God take him? Up to the bosom of Abraham. Well, that implies immediately in the Greek, oh, he's reclining on a couch leaning against the father Abraham. Well, if they're reclining, that means they're at a meal. Oh, Lazarus is now celebrating a festive banquet in heaven, and he's the guest of honor of Abraham because of the, that one little phrase, reclining at table. If you don't understand that, it doesn't have the punch that it would have otherwise. Mm, mm-hmm. And that, that, that's, I think, uh, the kind of insight that some background study, I mean, it really opens up the text in ways that, that you can't get at if you, if you don't have some of the cultural contextual background. Right. So, so that's one. Uh, baptize, the word baptize, we, uh, we've made it into a, a English verb, but in fact, all we've done is spell the Greek word in, in English or Roman alphabet, the word baptized means to plunge down, push down into the water. And it was an idiom for many things in the ancient world, one of them being like cleaning things. And baptism conveys that idea of the sacrament cleansing us of sin. But it also, and this is where St. Paul takes this nuance, but it also was an idiom often, surprisingly, used for dying, either by being stabbed, by having a sword plunged into you, or... Hmm you were plunged, plunged into the water in the sense of drowning. So when Paul says, do you not realize you have been baptized into his death? Well, I've always thought that was the weirdest kind of image. What does that mean, you're baptized into his death? Well, then you read the, the kind of the study of this odd verb, and you realize, oh, at the time of Jesus and before, that was an idiom both for dying and for washing. Ah, And then it also makes more sense of our ritual of ancient baptism, which was the deacon pushing you down into the water so that when you come up, the first thing you do is take a breath. Oh, 
three times I risk drowning, and three times in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, I <gasps> breathe in new life. Hmm. Well, that word conveys a lot of that kind of meaning. So that, that's one I, I, really, I really like, because you can tie in so much about Paul's theology of baptism with it. Sure. And some of the stuff about church teaching on the scriptures, uh, I think also is a surprise to a lot of Catholics, that all the way back to the 1800s, Pope Leo XIII was telling Catholic scholars that you need to catch up with this kind of historical, cultural, linguistic studies, uh, and really encouraging and demanding it of seminary professors, and then Pius XII in the, during the war, 1943, with his encyclical Divino Afante Spiritu, People are shocked to learn that for over a hundred years the church has been urging us to do this kind of study, but most Catholics are unaware of it. So I think that's a surprise for many. Yeah. All right. Well, this is such a, a great book and uh, a great thing to encourage people to study Scripture more thoroughly and and dispel some of the misconceptions about the Bible already. So where can people get a copy of it? Well, the answer to all such questions, Amazon.com, of course. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> uh, Amazon, of course, has it. It's Ave Maria Press at Notre Dame University as the publisher, and mm -hmm. they have it in their catalog. Yeah, I, I want to really make clear, Kyle, one thing that's really important to me is the last thing I want to do is make Scripture look intimidating. Hmm. You know, and as soon as you start talking about Greek and Hebrew and people's eyes roll up in the top of their head, they start to nod off. I mean, that's the opposite reaction of what I want. And this book, I hope, helps to get through that and, and, and make the, the Holy Scripture more accessible, not intimidating. Definitely. And people can get a copy of it. Again, it's called Abba Isn't Daddy and other biblical surprises, what Catholics really need to know about scripture study. Thank you so much, Father Bill Burton, for putting this together and sharing with us a little bit about your passion for scripture study. I appreciate it. Oh, Kyle, thank you. I really appreciate your inviting me.